one. Grab your hymn books. 259, Jesus saves us all. Stan will sing. 259, Jesus saves. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land. Climb the steeps and cross the waves. Onward tears our Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. In 259, we're on the second verse. Wept it on the rolling tide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Tell to sinners far and wide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing ye islands of the sea. Echo back the ocean caves. Perch the keeper to believe. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. All the last. In the winds of mighty voice, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free, highest hills and deepest caves. This our song of victory, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Well, good morning. Good to see you this morning. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll get things started. Brother Andrew, if you would, sir, would you open our service in prayer? Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm thankful to say you've given us from gathering on our house for knowing more about you. And Lord, just be with our fears to stay as a faith for you all. Just help us to learn something from it that we can abide for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, my brother. Please be seated. Good to see you this morning. I want to remind you we have uh, some things coming up. Uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, many of you are out each night uh, this past week, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Special guest speaker in town, Brother Paul Morrison. It was uh, such a great blessing. I uh, get to spend some time with him. And of course, hearing the preaching of God's Word. And many of you are out each night for that. Thank you so much. Of course, we gave a, uh, a love offering to our guest. And, and many of you were very generous with that. And I do appreciate that so much. And um, we have, of course, as we continue in our uh, uh, anniversary celebration throughout the month of October, of course, uh, with the revival services this past week, but also we have a, a cookout coming up uh, next, uh, this, this Saturday coming up, it's the 26th, and um, we're going to be, uh, there is a sign-up sheet in the back, we just we need to get an idea how many folks are going to show up so we can set up enough tables and chairs for everybody and make sure um, the, the accommodations are, are adequate, but also um, get an idea of what kind of food you're going to bring. I know um, there's the sign-up sheet is back there. Put your name down, a number of folks that are coming with you. Um, if you'd like to write down what you're going to bring, I know a lot, I saw a lot of check marks up there, it's like, like side dish, all right, which is fine, but if you want to indicate what you're bringing, that's fine too. Don't forget the desserts. There always got to be desserts. And, and so um, please, uh, please get your name on that so we can make appropriate plans. Uh, 4.30 is when we're going to be meeting on Saturday. We'll be uh, converging over at Dennis and Donna Street's house. Uh, come on out, enjoy it. Um, you know, stay late. Uh, they put the lights on out there and to get the fire going, and it's just always a great time of fellowship. So come and join us Saturday the 26th. Uh, over at Dennis and Donna Street's house. You don't have to get there, certainly. Just ask for directions. You shouldn't have any problems at all. And uh, again, thank you, um, you guys, for opening up your home to us. It's always a blessing. And so that's coming up on the 26th of this month. That's all the announcements I have for right now. Um, and uh, other than that, we got a, I don't see Brother Stephen for our memory verse. Oh, no. It's um, uh, um, Psalm 91. So take your Bibles. Turn the number. I, I got my pen already. I'm not, I guess the pins are over there. I'm not sure. I see, I see a brown bag, but I'm not sure if the pins are there. But uh, Psalm 91, if you would please, verse number 1 and 2 is our memory verse for this month. I said mine the other day and got my official New Testament Baptist Church pin for my memory verse, Psalm 91. And... Um, Let's all say that together. This is verse number one and two. 
He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Okay, that's Psalm 91, verse number 1 and 2. Anybody like to recite that this morning? Psalm 91, verse number 1 and 2 this morning. Going once, going twice. All righty. Thomas, if you would, please come up and listen to the song. Okay, grab your help. We'll put the change bucket out for the boys and girls. But 325, trust and obey. Hymn 325. Let's all stand and sing nice and loud. Here we go. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our while we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a shadow in a while there are songs that kind of get stuck in your head and uh, this one is uh, is one that gets stuck there every once in a while and uh, it's, it is a blessing uh, one, uh, one example that uh, if your kids are downstairs they don't know it now they must be sleeping but uh, one of the examples that uh, I bring up quite frequently downstairs is, um, is that verse while we were yet sinners Christ died for us and uh, I, I do feel for Owen sitting in my class because uh, he's an example quite frequently and um, used with an example. So I'll sit there and I'll tap his head and I'll keep tapping and tapping. And, uh, I, you know, joking, I'll say, hey, buddy, you're going to forgive me for tapping on your head. And, uh, and now I keep tapping him on his head. And as I'm tapping him, okay, why don't you, why don't you forgive me now while I'm actually tapping you on the head, you know? And uh, it's just a, it's kind of a fun way of kind of demonstrating that uh, while we were yet sinning, Christ was willing to die for us. And um, so this is kind of a, a, I don't know, a song that reminds me of that. I will serve thee because I love thee. You have given life me I was nothing before you found me you have given life to me heartaches broken peace 
life soar why you died on Calvary your touch is what I long for you have given life to me hard in pieces ruin life are why you died on Calvary your touch is what I long for you have given life to me and girls if you're in junior church beginners church head on downstairs see y'all later please take your bibles this morning and join me in the book of philippians chapter 4 philippians chapter 4 we are getting to place here in the philippians is kind of like if, if I can say it this way, it's actually the reason why he wrote uh, the, the letter. It's, it's the thank you portion uh, of, the book of, uh, of the book of Philippians. And uh, I don't know um, about you, but uh, it's always nice to get thank you notes from folks. I don't do things in order to get notes from people, but uh, uh, often is the case. You give somebody a gift or you show up at a, an event or whatever, um, and, you know, in the mail, you'll get something that says, thank you very much. And uh, just the other day, we got uh, just a, a message um, via um, instant message from someone that we had uh, just recently mailed something to, just to kind of, it was just a fun thing to do. And, and uh, they wrote us back and a nice, nice thank you. And, and so we don't necessarily do things for thank yous, but thank yous are always good. And I, I just want to say this. Uh, this was uh, several months ago uh, as we were going through some portions of Scripture, not only here in Philippians, but in some other places, we talked about thankfulness. It's one of the evidences, um, characteristics of, of a Christian life is thankfulness, whether it be to God or whether it be to others. And if you remember uh, during that, uh, that message at the end of it, I encourage you to be very mindful of saying thank you to folks throughout the week. And I, I Personally, I did that, and I was just thanking folks for all kinds of different things and uh, just trying to be as, as thankful and generous as I possibly could with my, with my observation of what they've done uh, for me. And so uh, I, I just simply uh, want to bring out the fact that this is what the letter of Philippians actually was intended for. It was a response to the generosity of the church there in Philippi of their financial support for Paul's ministry. Not only here, he's in prison and they're sending a financial gift to him. They, he, they also, of course, had sent money for him once and again to his necessities when he was on his missions journeys. Um, he's gonna mention them again when he says churches of Macedonia, this is one of them in their benevolence giving to the, to the saints in Jerusalem that were going through some difficult times uh, with, a, um, with a drought and there was some great financial needs uh, there in the church in Jerusalem to help people out. And so th this is an extremely generous church and so the thank you portion is here. And so I would ask you please to look at Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to start reading in verse number 10 and just read down through a few verses as we get started this morning. Would you please stand as we read God's word this morning? Philippians chapter 4 beginning in verse number 10 he says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care for me hath flourished again wherein ye were also careful but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want for I have learned that uh, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both, both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and 
to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Verse number 13, classic verse. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Let's pray. Father, do thank you, Lord, for your precious word. And I ask you, Lord, as we speak about this subject of contentment this morning, Lord, that you would encourage our hearts. Help us to understand how wonderful you are. All the things that you have done in our lives. And Father, that we can, we can trust you in all things. I pray that you had blessed now in the preaching of your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please be seated. The, um, the section here that we're getting started with, and it's going to run down uh, for, for quite a while, and he's going to talk about this um, through uh, a, a good part of the rest of this chapter. It is, it's about money. It is. And it's not that Paul is uh, obsessed with it. He's not demanding uh, and asking for any resources or finances. As a matter of fact, the only time you see Paul really talking about money in his epistles is when he's uh, talking about that, uh, that benevolent gift that they were taking up for the saints back in Jerusalem. As I mentioned, there was a drought. Uh, it, there was a famine in the land. Um, we haven't had rain here in Jersey. For, what are we going on, like 24 days or something like that? This is kind of unique for us. Um, I was, uh, I, Brother Carlos and I were just commenting last night because uh, we had bought that beautiful, gigantic mums out there. I am not good with flowers. I'm horrible. And um, we had put it out front of the church, and I didn't even think anything of it. But it didn't rain for a week and a half, and all that thing just dried right up, you know. Uh, and because uh, generally, you know, if you put a, you get some flowers, and at least you put it outside, it's going to get rained on. Well. Um, um, our, our mums did not survive the drought and uh, the church in Jerusalem, uh, there was a lot of folks in the church in Jerusalem that were really suffering because there was a tremendous drought and um, they were relying upon uh, God's children to help them. And that's, when, when Paul talks about money, most of the time he's making reference, in, in reference to people giving money, most of the time he's talking about that. So it's not, not even for himself but for the help of others. And so Paul doesn't spend a lot of time talking about money. He doesn't ask people to support his ministry. He doesn't uh, bemoan himself of how, you know, a poor missionary me never does that. Um, but he's the first to say, thank you so much for your generosity. You guys have been a blessing. That's what this portion of scripture is about. Um, this is not a rich church, and yet it's the one that Paul uses as an example of generosity to other churches, especially there in, at Corinth. He, he brings them up. Um, we're going to talk eventually in these, you know, as we go through this portion of Scripture over the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk eventually about money and about supporting missions and things like that. But what I want to speak about today is not the giving portion of the church, but more the receiving portion of, of Paul. And he, and he uses that, this particular phrase in verse number 11. He says, For I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And that's what I want to speak about this morning is contentment. You know, our society is, is, is driven by discontentment. And it doesn't matter what it is, because, you know, contentment doesn't sell, by the way. If you want to sell something, um, you have to make sure that people are discontent. So whether it be our politics or our peanut butter, it really doesn't matter. You're being told it's not good enough, you need something better, you need more, uh, you shouldn't be happy with what you got. You got I, I've got something, I got something for you. And so our society is driven by discontentment. And so because of that particular um, mentality that, that is marketed to us, so many folks live a life of discontentment. They're never satisfied with anything. Always having that quest for something better or something more and yet never being satisfied. 
And so we see Paul using this term, and he's going to use it many other places in Scripture. And we're going to see, we'll be looking at some of that this morning. But the Apostle uh, Paul, he knew that his contentment um, would never come from anything that he had or even anything that he experienced, but his contentment actually came from what he was, and that was a child of God. He had Jesus, and that was enough for him. And so as we talk about contentment this morning, we're not talking about dollars and cents, and we're not talking about, um, you know, um, experiencing anything in this world, but we're looking beyond the world that we live in in order to gain a sense of contentment in our lives. And, and that's what I want to talk about today. Please notice in our text here, as I, I've already read this, but if you'll notice again in verse number 11, it says in, in 411, he said, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatever state I am therewith to be content. And the first observation I make from this portion of Scripture is that contentment is actually something that's learned. He says, I've learned to be content. You know, likely he, uh, and, and rightfully so, he learned it from God. God taught him to be content. You know, certain lessons are easy to learn and others are not. And contentment is, not, is a lesson that it often requires a good bit of instruction. I would ask you please to keep your place here, but turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And um, in the Bible, there's a couple words that are, very, uh, that are related together in reference to this subject matter. Content is here, contentment is used. There's another word, and that word is sufficient or sufficiency. You'll see that word used several times in the scriptures, and I just present before you that those two words are, are directly connected together. So when, when there is a sufficiency, then a person is content. Here we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 9, the Bible says this. This is a section of scripture that Paul is talking about where he, he's talking about the, uh, um, if you would please, an out-of-body experience that had taken place. He doesn't say it's him, but if you do the math, you know that it is. And how he was going up into the second heaven and, and, uh, and, and God did something in his life. And, and this, is, this is Paul's observation. I'm starting in verse number nine. And he said unto me, this is, God saying unto, unto Paul, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul says this, Most gladly, therefore, I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. What we're talking about is actually some kind of, as Paul describes it, is his thorn in the flesh. We don't know exactly what that is. Lots of speculation uh, probably the best explanation I have ever heard is that Paul had some had bad eyesight. Um, could you imagine being a, a preacher and not being able to see very well? Uh, we, of course, when we lived out in the Midwest, there was a pastor that would, uh, a preacher that would often come, an evangelist that would often come to our church. Probably, he, would pro he was at Berea at least three times. I had saw him preach at a couple other places also uh, there in the Midwest. And, and uh, he was blind. He wasn't born blind. He had a degenerative disease and he lost his eyesight over a period of time. And um, so by the time that I got to know him, he was completely blind. Um, he, um, uh, his wife traveled with him all the time, of course, and uh, took him everywhere. So you could imagine what it's like if you're blind. Uh, I get up in the pulpit and I open up my notes and I open up my Bible and I read and I look at my notes and Imagine not being, brother, imagine not being able to do that. Yeah. And, and so he, um, he relied completely on other people to do everything. And my, oh my, could he preach. The whole sermons, of course, is memorized. All the text that he would read is memorized. 
And my, oh my, he could preach. He had, the, he had, a, he had a wristwatch. And the face of the, the glass of the wristwatch would flip up and he'd take the wristwatch off and he'd set it on the pulpit. He'd lift the glass up and he, could, he would touch the, the, uh, the hands of the, of, the, of the watch to see what time it was. And um, he's just an amazing preacher. He would finish preaching and somebody would have to come up and escort him off the, off the podium. And um, I could imagine um, as he was losing his eyesight the thoughts that he would have of why God would call him into the ministry, given the opportunity to preaching the word of God and then take away one of the greatest resources that we all depend on every single day of our lives. I could imagine somebody could lose a little bit of contentment. I don't know if that was Paul's malady, his thorn in the flesh, He's, uh, there, there are hints about that throughout the scriptures, but I don't know if that's the case. But I will say this, whatever was um, getting under Paul's skin, whatever was bothering him that he would get before God and just plead with him, and God says, nope, my grace is sufficient. In other words, I want you to be content with your situation in life because I got a handle on this. Now we all find ourselves in some kind of predicament or another, whether it be some type of physical malady or or different backgrounds or or stresses that we have in our life, experiences uh, that have kind of left some scars in our lives that we all have to deal with. We refer to it as our baggage. And we all got it. We got, some of us got closets filled with the baggage of our past life. And Jesus, uh, we, we may plead with him, but Christ comes to Paul and says, you know, I'm not taking this away. Because if you're going to be content, it's, you're going to be content because I'm teaching you to hang on to my grace. And that's enough. Is, is that enough for us? You know, as we talk about contentment, often we always just think of the dollars and cents and and our prosperity and what we own and what we have and what we possess, those type of things. But real contentment is is, is not necessarily only played out in the physical things that we accumulate in our lives, but real contentment deals with every situation, every part of our life where we have to say, is, is Christ enough in this? whether it be disease or whether it be some deficiency or, or, you know, whether it be the dollars and cents, is Christ enough? Paul learned to be content. Here in Philippians chapter 4, he's talking about money. He is talking about the resources. He's He's in jail. And I, I want to remind you that in the situation he's in in Rome, it's, it's not like, you know, when, people, when folks go to prison uh, here in the United States of America, uh, you know, they get, they get three square meals a day. They get a, you know, whatever. They get, uh, they get resources. Um, one of the companies I worked for years ago, I had a civil engineering firm, and I used to do a little bit of work for them. And I remember being in the office one day and they were going over some blueprints of, of, of a layout. And it was a federal prison. Uh, and I'm looking at the, at the drawings and I'm talking to the guys and, and they used to refer to it as club fed. And uh, just jokingly, and they're pointing out, okay, here, you know, here's the basketball courts, here's the weight room, here's the, the TV room, and, and, they're, and here's the library and they're pointing out all the amenities uh, of this of this prison system, and I said, "Well, that's. I mean, I wouldn't want to go to prison, but you know, here in here in the U.S., uh, there's a lot of things taken care of. Uh, that's not what it was like in Rome. He was under house arrest. Uh, that meant that he had to hire his own house. He had to rent a house to live there. Um, nobody was bringing him three meals a day. He was completely dependent upon the generosity of others." to make sure that his meals were taken care of, that he had the things that he needed. 
Now that still happens today in some places across the world. As a matter of fact, in some hospitals that folks find themselves in in other countries, um, you know, if, if you need a meal, you're going to get fed because your family brought you food. If you're going to need bandages, you're going to have it because your family provided the, these type of things. So it still happens today. I realize that. Uh, and I hope that you do too. But Paul, in this letter, he is expressing his, his thankfulness for their generosity. But he says, I'm, I'm content. I don't know how things are going to happen. I don't know where things are going to come from. Um, but it's a, it's a good feeling to be where God wants you to be, doing what God wants you to do, and to be able to sit back and say, I'm going to trust God on this one. There's a lot of times we get discontent with a lot of things because things aren't playing out the way that we think they are. I'm sure that Paul it wasn't way up on Paul's list to end up in prison in Rome. But now, now that he's there, he's, he's still content because he believes God's in control. So I don't know where your, your uh, struggles are with discontentment, but it plays out in a lot of different ways. It, it plays out in relationships that, are, that, that we're a part of. It plays out in maybe, maybe your job or your career. It, it plays out in your household where you're thinking, you know, this is not what I thought it was going to be. My, my, you know, relationship with my spouse or my children. And I'm not saying we just throw our hands up. It's not like a fatalistic approach where we say, I can't do anything about it, so I might as well be content with it. A contentment is that dependency upon the grace of God. Because we're always wanting, so I'm not happy with this relationship. I always want something better. I want something more. I want something that's different. But contentment says, I want what God wants for me. I don't understand what that's going to be, but I, I want whatever God wants. Contentment is a learned thing. My grace is sufficient. Is God's grace sufficient? So often is the case that we lack this, this, um, this feeling of sufficiency because we are not dependent upon the grace of God. I suppose if contentment is a learned thing, then I suppose that discontentment is a learned thing also, uh, is, is also learned. And I, I do want to remind um, parents that are here that you have a responsibility to make sure you teach your children to be content. There's, and now, there's no easy way. I'm sure you can Google it and get a list somewhere. Three easy steps of teaching to contentment. Um, it's, it's not easy. It's, uh, it's uh, presenting to your children um, the fact that uh, you know, there's no free ride, that they, they should earn what they have, that there's a responsibility of caring for things. Contentment is played out in a lot of different ways. Uh, I want to read just one verse of Scripture in reference to that, and that's from Luke chapter 12, verse number 15. Jesus said this, he said, take heed, beware of covetousness. And this is what he said, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Jesus said those words. A man's life consisted not of the things which he possesseth. There are too many people that measure their life by their stuff. If you measure your life by your stuff, you will never be content because it never satisfies. And there are folks that go throughout their entire lives just accumulating and wanting more stuff. And you don't have to be rich to want more stuff. Even poor folk can be discontent. Because it's when the possessions become what life's all about, then you actually you don't have the possessions. The possessions have you. You become enslaved to it. You don't look to stuff as the, as the, only, as the source of your personal pleasures. The, um, when Christ was telling that parable about this man who you know, was a farmer and he has this abundance of crops and... He's, he's got all these resources, and he says, he said, and, and this is what the farmer said, for I, um, um, he said this, um, he said, my soul, 
Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. This is from Luke 12, 19, if you're taking notes. He said, I have much goods laid up for many years. Take thy ease, eat, drink, and be merry. In, in other words, it's that desire of accumulating and getting stuff. And when you have stuff, you think, this is what's going to make me happy. But pleasure is always short-lived. A, a, this contentment is not found in the accumulation of stuff. Discontentment is learned when we associate the pleasure of life with stuff, when we associate um, fulfillment with stuff. Discontentment is what we learn. Because you always want more. You always want what's next. You'll always want something new, and you will always need something. Let me just ask you to fill in the blank in your own head right now. If only I had blank, I'd be happy. And we, we all have that blank. And we all try to, we try to fill it in. And we live a life often of discontentment because we think everything is surrounded about around this particular thing. And you will never be content because even when that blank gets filled in, it won't be enough and you'll want something more. Learning to be content without filling in that blank is what Paul had and what God offers to us. Please, back in our text here in Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 11, he said, not that I speak in respect of want, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And, and so not only is contentment something that's learned, but it, he, it, contentment is a whatsoever. I, I, just, I know that sounds kind of awkward, but he, he uses that term, whatsoever state I am. And so Contentment is a is is whatsoever. It is um, it's it's focused, and Paul is not he's Paul is not focusing on his condition. It is not based on our condition in life. So when we think about condition, you know, he talks about a based and abound. I'm rich. I'm poor. Uh, I'm in prison. I'm free. I, I'm you know I'm I'm going around preaching. I'm locked in a room. Whatever state you're in. So we're not talking about the state of New Jersey, of course. We're talking about the state of our life. And we have to be reminded of the fact that our, our state will change constantly. Our time of, our, our, uh, of life is going to change. We all get older. I mean, we're all, going, we're all going to get old eventually, right? We just didn't, didn't know it was going to be so quick. You know, for, a, for so many years, and you know, you guys have humored me. You know, I, I denied the fact of getting old, and, and uh, so I, I've been joking around for a long, actually, since I was 49 years old, I started that joke that I'm going to do the Moses thing. I'm going to live to 120. You all heard that. I've said it from the pulpit here a gazillion yeah. times. And so uh, the reason I did that is because it, would it, if I lived to 120, that, that moved middle age all the way up to 60. Now I'm 64. Oh! So I've already committed to the 120 years. Um, I've always I've joked around for years about the fact that, you know, I'm, I plan on dying with my boots on. You're going to have to drag me out of here. You know, um, when I die, you know, I'll be preaching up here at a pulpit at 99 years old. And um, over the last uh, couple of years, so many folks that I've known that have been in the ministry um, are, are retiring. And I'm thinking, why are they going to retire? Blah, blah, blah. And they ought to be preaching. And uh, then I realize as the years tick on, I know why they're retiring. And, um, and, I, and I, uh, maybe, uh, maybe I'll still do the 120 years. You never know. But, um, but I know I'm not, in, I'm not in the same state I am 
uh, today that I was 10 years ago. Our states change. Our condition in life, whether it be, you know, poverty or wealth, whether it be kids in the home or out of the home, whether it be the job that we have or the loss of a job, whether it be our good health and our ill health, whether it be the friends or the betrayals, our state and life changes and can change overnight. Are we content? Does our contentment only come when things are going the way that we expect them to go and how the, you know, the outcome is I've, I've already got it predetermined. This is, I, this is how I see it. This is how it's going to be. And if it's not that way, are we not content? You know, Paul mentions this. I'm reading from 1 Timothy 6. And he, has, he, says, he talks a lot about money in 1, Corinthians, in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And, and he, he does that. But he says in verse number 6, he said, But godliness with contentment is great gain. And, he, and, and then he makes this observation. We, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. And, and Paul makes the observation, he's relaying it to Timothy, and, and of course, you know, Timothy's dealing with folks in the church there in Ephesus, and there's, there's going to be some wealthy people, there's going to be some poor people. He's, you know, he's got to deal with, you know, different people in different stages of their life, and, but he just makes this, he makes the statement to Timothy about that. And it's an observation not only for himself, but also for Timothy and, and other folks there in that ministry of learning the fact that, you know, there's um, things change all the time financially. You know, we had some financial stuff go on in, in our, in, in this country uh, over the past couple years. It got kind of weird. Most, most folks that I know have some kind of retirement thing and the 401ks and a lot of it invested in stocks and you know what, five or six years ago, people were losing, you know, look at their, fi- their retirement um, thump and all, they, all of a sudden they, they've lost 10 or 20 or $30,000 overnight, just like, just like that. I was reading an article about um, um, some of the richest people in the world, you know, people like Bill Gates and Elon Musk, and it's nothing for them to wake up in the morning and be a billion dollars short in their, checking, in their checkbook, you know. Could you imagine waking up tomorrow morning and being a billion dollars short in your checkbook? Okay. Um, so I just want to remind you that things are so volatile financially. And if your contentment is only based on the, um, on the figure that you have in your 401k, um, then, then you're going to be disappointed someday. Contentment is not, is not based on the state of affairs in our life. It must be rooted in something beyond that. Paul writes again, I'm reading from 2 um, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, if you would please, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. uh, Paul Paul has a lot to say about contentment and sufficiency, and and you can see so often um, those things found throughout the scriptures here. But 2 Corinthians chapter 9, I'll start in verse number 6. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, not out of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. And that's an interesting observation that Paul makes to the church there in Corinth. And he's talking about, you know, this is, this is about dollars and cents here. He's talking about um, the benevolence fund. He's talking about giving and, 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 and such as that. And so, but he, he makes this observation that the, the generosity that, the, that he's asking for, this, uh, what, it, what it does is it, it, it breeds sufficiency, it breeds contentment. 
So in, in other words, if, if we're not holding on so tightly to our, to our possessions in this world, if we have a generous spirit, if, we are, if we're you know, pleading with God, you know, please help me to be a blessing to other people. And sometimes you know, that doesn't require anything financial, but certainly it, inqu- it requires some type of giving. Sometimes it's even of, just of ourselves and of our time and our talents. But if we have a generous spirit, what it does is it breeds a feeling of contentment. Because our satisfaction doesn't rest in our possessions. What we, without we view anything that we have as being something that God has given to us. It's His grace that we have it to begin with. Anything that we have that God has given to us, we view as something that God can use through us to be a blessing to others. That changes everything. That that gives contentment. God has brought this into my life. What is what is he having what is he in store for it? How, how can I use this, these resources, these finances, this talent or this ability? How can I use it to be a blessing to other people? You'll find that that'll bring a lot of contentment in your life. If we go through life thinking, I want, I want, I want, you will never be satisfied. But if you go through life thinking, I will, I will, I will, there's a lot of satisfaction and contentment that comes along with that. It has so often been said there's two types of people in this world. There are givers and there are takers. That plays through in a lot of different ways. I understand that. You could probably make a long list of two types of people. There are two types of people in this world. Those that use blinkers and those that don't. That'll preach. But there, yeah, there's two types of people in this world. There are givers and there are takers. Takers will never be satisfied. Because they're never going to take enough. Givers will always have a contentment in their life because they understand the value of what they have. And the value is not found on hanging on to it. The value is found on how God's going to use it. Be a blessing to others. You'll find a lot of contentment there. I want to remind you, and uh, go with me to Luke chapter 3. And... um, Matter of fact, we were reading this portion of Scripture probably a week, maybe a couple of weeks ago. I don't remember when it was, but we were talking about um, the change that takes place in a person's life when there's true salvation, repentance takes place. And Luke chapter 3, uh, Paul, um, excuse me, John the Baptist is baptizing. Folks are getting saved. He preaches a message of repentance uh, and a trust in a Messiah, which is soon to come. John had a tremendous message in preparing a people for the Lord Jesus Christ when he would come. And folks are getting saved and they're asking that question. You know, what, what, do, we, what do we do now that we're saved? What do we do? Talking about that fruit, that, that, that repent, that true repentance brings. And, and uh, please notice in Luke chapter 3 and verse number 14 particularly, um, we have soldiers. These are Roman soldiers that are getting saved. Amen to that. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. Just an observation here. Treat people fairly. I mean, do your job. He didn't tell tell them to leave, leave the Roman legion, that wicked bunch of folks. No, no believer needs to be there. He doesn't say that at all. He said, but you know, live a godly life while you're there, and it's going to, be, it's going to play out in how you, how you treat other people. But personally, be content. Learn to be content. So I, I, I read this in John the Baptist statement, so I'm, I'm thinking, it, can, can contentment be a choice? Choose to be content? Oh, it sure is possible, isn't it? 
Contentment is a choice. You choose to view your possessions in a particular way. You choose to understand that God is the one who, by His grace, supplies all your needs. You choose to say, you know, Lord, whatever whatever situation I have in my life, I'm sufficient with that because it's your grace that allows me to be this way, to be in this situation. And certainly, I think we would all say, I would prefer to abound as compared to being abased. Paul uses those terms. Abased means Things are really low. Things are getting bad. I don't know how ends are going to meet. But then, you know, to abound means there's enough, and I don't have to worry about it. You, I'm sure everyone here has been in both of those states at one time or another and have gone back and forth on, on many occasions. There are many times, I, you know, in, in our lives, and I, I speak for myself personally, where, you know, you're let's just living one paycheck after another. And you're kind of wondering how we're going to pay the bills. I've been there, done that. And you're wondering, you know, or, or, or I got to get the ends to meet. Well, sometimes you got to do a lot of stretching to get the ends to meet. But God is faithful. We would prefer to abound. But what happens when and things are abased? You choose to be content. Choosing to be content doesn't mean that you just kind of throw your hands up and say, whatever. Choosing to be content doesn't mean you choose to be lazy and say, well, I'm, you know, God, God will provide for it, so I'm not going to work. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going I'm to I'm wait and see what God's going to do. God requires us to be faithful at particular things, especially, uh, fellas, particularly if you have a family. Take care of your family. But I want to remind you that when things are good, praise God. When things are bad, praise God. Understand that it's His grace that gets us through either situation. The reality of it is that many people that become, that go from the abased to the abound often lose contentment. Because in living in such a way for so long, all of a sudden you have resources and our reliance and dependence upon God seems to wane as our wealth begins to wax. And in doing so, we lose contentment. Our prayer life and the things that we pleaded for in the past are now gone. Our... um, our desire of living a simple life often goes out the door also. And in doing so, we become less and less dependent upon God and often more dependent upon our own feeling of resources and ability. Learn to be, learn to be content and choose contentment Our text said, in whatever state I am, therewith to be content. Contentment is is what we are. Are you content? Is it enough? When I first started in my career as a draftsman, 17 years old, right out of high school, took my first drafting job, making just above minimum wage, um, $2.85. This is back in 1978. And um, the company I worked for, um, worked there for many years, of course, got married while I was working there, had our first child while we were working there, expecting our second one when I finally left there. But anyway, I was working there and... and, um, making 285 and and then I ended up getting saved my life really changed in a lot of different ways I actually became um, I actually began to began to really care about things I was doing I didn't really I, I didn't care much for things I was just kind of getting by in life and not really focused on a lot of stuff I got saved it really changed a lot of stuff I actually became a really good employee apparently 
My boss was thrilled about the work I was doing. And, um, you know, that 25 cent an hour raise was phenomenal, you know. And, uh, you know, back then it was something. Uh, and um, uh, I, I got up to uh, $4.25 an hour um, working there. I'm, so I'm, you know, that's a pretty good jump over a couple of years. Uh, they had a they had a they had a sal, uh, they had a wage cap there at that company. Um, they would not pay anybody that was on the drafting floor more than four and a quarter. I I got to the top. I was top tier, you know, and and thrilled about it. I went to my boss and um, and of course Joyce and I had been married for now over a year. But we were, Buzz was born, and uh, and I joke around. This is you know standard joke of mine when I do premarital counseling. I tell folks, two can live as cheap as one, but only half as long. And so, uh, you know, we're, I'm doing the math, and we're not doing really well. And I, I go to my boss. I said, you know, uh, his name was Paul. I said, Paul, I, I really, I said, I got a family. I just, at four and a quarter, I, you guys are generous, but, you know, I, I just can't. I, I just, I, I need more. And he said, well, you know, we're not going to be able to pay you anymore. And he says, you can work as much overtime as you want. And it, I'm thinking to myself, nope, I'm not going to do that. I mean, I, I appreciated the offer, but I had a family, and, and I don't want to spend more time away from them just to make ends meet. And I, you know, I thanked him, and I started looking and, and um, got a job at another company. Um, I, 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 I doubled my income in, in, one, in one move. And you know now I'm making I don't know nine fifty nine seven nine something another. I mean you're thinking that ain't much. Well, it was back in the early '80s, okay. And uh, and I look at that, and I look myself personally. I look back at that, and it wasn't that I was discontent with anything. I just knew that God had provided for me this, this great salvation. I'd gotten saved. My Joyce was saved. We were starting to have kids. And I knew God would provide for my family. And, you know, got into that company, worked there for a few years, uh, got some great training. Uh, another opportunity came up. I, and I, I'm going to say this, and, and it's, it's just something, this is me, all right? Um, there's, there was never a time that I ever went to my boss and say, listen, you need to pay me more or I'm leaving. I never threatened. I never made those, those type of statements. I, I always look to God and say, Lord, you know, you know what the needs are. And, and God always provided. And I left that company, went to another company, and God just blessed. And I was, I, I don't even know how much money, I, I don't remember how much money I was making per hour back then. I was always hourly kind of guy. I was never a salary type of fella. And... Um, it was, it was such a blessing. And then God burdened me for the ministry. And, and I, you know, I was, in, I was in school, I was working on my engineering degree and, and, you know, night classes. And it was just, everything was just, I had, I had a plan. I had a plan. And, uh, and, and I just, you know, I, I walked away from that. We moved to Missouri, went to Bible college, I moved out there. I had, I had zero leads you know, as far as, you know, what I was going to do when I got out there. But I had a family, I had four children, um, need, you know, we're going to buy a house out there. And I had nothing. And, you know, I, I took a job as the janitor at a grocery store, Smitty's, and they were paying $4 an hour. Yeah. I just spent all that time going from engineering firm to engineering firm to engineering firm, working my way up, you know, as far as the, and now I was making less than I was making when I was working at that first one um, X amount of years ago. And you know what? God provided everything that we needed. It was the greatest thing. And I didn't sit back on, oh, I'm going to push a broom for the next, you know, four years while I'm in college. You know, I had some resumes out there, and, and you know, I wasn't, I wasn't concerned about it. But my contentment didn't come from the dollar sign on my paycheck. My contentment came from the fact that I was where God wanted me to be, and I knew he would take care of things. 
And I was going to do everything I could to make sure my family was provided for, but I trusted God. I wasn't worried about the dollars and cents. And God did. You know, a couple months later, I get a phone call. The company, I'd put a resume in, say, hey, when can you start? And I said, well, i got to give my two-week notice to the, <laughs> to the grocery store that's paying me four bucks an hour, you know. And, uh, and so I did that. And, you know, we were there, of course, eight years instead of four years. But um, all during that period of time, you know, well, the paycheck coming in, the raises came in. They, oh, they took so good care of me. And such a blessing to work for that company. And uh, they were so generous to me in, a, in so many different ways. And God always provided. And one of the reasons, uh, one of the reasons is simply this, that God takes care of his people. Contentment is something that you learn God often has to take us through some things to learn that, but it is something that you learn. It is a choice that you make. And it is, it, it does surround, it, it, contentment is driven by your attitude towards life. Your, the, the stuff that you have, the situation that you're in, it's your perception of that. Because if you have the, if, if all life is, is the abundance of stuff, then you will never be content. But if you take a step back away from that and think to yourself, listen, anything that I have is by God's grace. And if all I have is is clothes to wear and food to eat and that's that's all I'm going to end up with, then then I'm content. If If your contentment is not driven by the accumulation of what you have or your situation in life, you will learn to be content. And I asked you a question this morning. Are you content? Is Jesus enough? Is the salvation that God has brought into your life, is it sufficient? I was reading uh, something just, uh, I'll I'll end with this. I was just reading something the other day because I'm putting together this message. I'm reading gobs of stuff about contentment. And this one particular person, he made this statement um, as he's sitting down um, and has... uh, all, you know, dinners in front of them, all this abundance of, of food and, and friends around the table. And, and he, he bows his head and he, and he says this. This is, this is someone's observation of this. It was great. He says, he said, all of this and Jesus too. And, you know, it's, it starts with our contentment in the fact that we are the children of God and that God has saved us. And God has brought in our life this abundance of, of, of salvation and that God wants to use us in this world in some way, shape, or form and that God will, through His grace, supply what is necessary, what is sufficient for us in order to carry out the work that He's given us to do. Some of us are going to abase and some of us are going to abound. Some of us, we're going to, it's going to be both. Oh, it's going to be all over the spectrum. But the reality of it is, is that whatever we're going through, whatever we're dealing with, whatever we have or don't have, um, it is sufficient because our sufficiency rests in God. Learn to be content. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you, Lord. You have been so good to us. God, you have provided so much. You've done so many wonderful things. And Lord, there are times that we go through some trials and we, we, we see some deficiencies, some things that are lacking. And Lord, we are often tempted to be discontent. I pray you'd forgive us. Help us, Lord to look to you and to find our satisfaction. Lord, I am so thankful for your son Jesus, for the glorious and wonderful salvation that you have brought. 
Lord, I, I pray that we would learn to be satisfied, to find our sufficiency solely resting upon your grace. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand.